transfigured on the mount, O Christ our God, revealing thy glory to thy disciples as far as they could bear it. Let thine everlasting light shine upon us sinners through the prayers of the Theotokos, O giver of light, glory to Thee. Hi there. My name is Father Thanasios, and I am the Dean here at the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Tarpon Springs, Florida and I'm your host for Be Transfigured Ministries. Welcome to another live Bible study on the book of 1 Corinthians, inspired by the homilies of St. John Chrysostom. If you are new to our Bible study, let me share with you how it works. There is a study guide. You can get the study guide on my website, liveanewlifeinchrist.org. Go to Bible studies and you maneuver all the way down to session 30, tonight is session 37 and you'll pull up the study guide. There's also a video there, but if you're watching me, you already know about the video. But on the website there, you'll see the study guide and you'll also see a link to a free copy of the homily for tonight that you can read uh, preferably in advance, hopefully. Um, so maybe next week, if you're new to us, you can read up in advance to be able to get a little bit more out of the conversation in our Bible study. And then <clears throat> there is a live chat room, but in order to participate in the live chat room, you need to be watching on YouTube directly. So if you're not on YouTube, if you're on either my website or you're on Facebook or X or anything like that, then you need to go to YouTube in the bottom right corner of your screen. You can launch this video in YouTube directly. Then you can participate in the live chat room. The chat room is moderated by none other than the most brilliant, most spectacular, Presvita Ravasi, my wife, who many do not realize has the exact same education as the priests do. She is a graduate of Holy Cross Seminary. But she does not have all the classes on how to do priestly things, but she has the regular theology classes and things like that. So she'll be moderating the chat room. And so if you have any questions, you can throw them in there. And Presvita, if I give her permission to use the microphone, we'll be able to chime in and throw your question our way and we'll be, at it, be able to add it to the conversation. So a little bit about St. John Chrysostom. Our Bible study was um, probably in the year 385 AD when he was a priest in Antioch. And that is important for us because in order for us to get the biggest bang for the buck, as it were, we understand that when St. Paul was preaching to the Corinthians in the first century, Corinth was much like modern day America, highly educated, very secular, very wealthy, and also very divided. There was a lot of uh, divisions within the church there uh, within, within Corinth. Someone just tried coming in, I have no idea who that was. It was a derby, it was a derby track. Oh. Um, but also St. John Chrysostom was a priest in Antioch and 3rd, 4th century Antioch, much like contemporary America, was highly educated, very secular, very multicultural, very wealthy, and also very divided. So we can get a lot from not only St. Paul, but also St. John Chrysostom. On the study guide, you'll see three different sections of the study guide. First is what's called the text analysis, the traditional chapter verse kind of explanation. And tonight's Bible study session is on chapter 14, verses 20 through 33. You will then see what I call the life application. And St. John Chrysostom, sometimes inspired by one word or one verse, launches into a teaching that I call life application. Because as I've said many, many times, it doesn't make a difference even if we memorize the scriptures. If it does not somehow change the way we live, it is a useless exercise. And then finally, we have what I call the send-off, which is going to 
inspire us into the next week so we can live a new life in Christ uh, inspired by St. Paul and St. John Chrysostom awaiting our next Bible study. So, Presbytera, yes, do we have anybody online tonight? We, we have, have a lot, lot of people, people online, online tonight. tonight. I, I see, see Randall, Randall and Denise and, and John and Mike Greer and Jean and I'm wondering if my Thea Gloria and Liz have logged on yet. I feel kind of like a romper room, and I see Billy, and I see Susie. Some of you are too young to remember Romper Room, but it was a children's show back in the olden days, in the 1970s. I think the people, the people on the chat room are not too young. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and start with our prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Shine within our hearts, loving Master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your gospel. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having conquered sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual life, thinking and doing all those things which are pleasing to you. For you, Christ our God, are the light of our souls and bodies, and do we give glory together with without the beginning in your all holy good and life creating spirit, always, now, and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. 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 Okay, so session 37, homily 36 out of 44. So we, the light is at the end of the tunnel. Woo, yay. All right, so do I have a volunteer to read chapter 14, verses 20, to 20 through 33? Yes, grab the microphone. Remember, good and close and nice and crystal clear. Brethren, do not be children in thoughts, yet be infants when it comes to evil. Be mature in your thoughts. It is written in the law, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people. Yet not even thus will they hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Prophesying is also a sign, not to the unbelieving, but to those who believe. If, therefore, the whole church is assembled and all speak in tongues, and someone untaught or unbelieving comes in, will this person not say that you are crazy? But if all prophesy, and if someone who is unbelieving or untaught does come in, that one is convinced, yet judged by all. Thus the secrets of that person's heart will be revealed. And falling down on the face and expressing adoration to God, this person will proclaim that indeed God is among you. What is it then, brethren? When you come together, each one of you has a psalm, a teaching, a saying in a tongue, a revelation, or an interpretation. Let all these things be done to build each other up. If someone speaks in another tongue, let it be to two or at the most three of them, one at a time, and then someone should interpret. But if there is no interpreter, the one who speaks in tongues should remain silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak, two or three of them, and then let the others ponder on what was said. But if a revelation is made to another sitting by, the first speaker should then keep silent. Certainly, all of you can prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and be exhorted. The prophetic spirit is to be under the prophet's control, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Don't think I didn't notice the different translation, sneaky. I don't have time to get my real Bible. <laughs> Your real Bible. Your real Bible. All right. But, as we know, uh, there are 110 different English translations, I think it's 112 nowadays, English translations of the scriptures, and you are reading one of the Orthodox translations, so it's perfectly, perfectly, it's just all of a sudden I realized, what, 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 and then I realized you were, what you were reading from. Okay, so, um, again, if you're, if you're new, what you'll see in the study guide is you'll see section numbers, and section numbers are merely how you can find what I'm drawing out of the homily in the homily itself as the editors have put in the section numbers. There's no correlation theologically or what have you, but the editors have broken it into sections. And so I use those same section numbers to be able to find the quote in the homily itself. So make it easier for you to find. But again, um, it's not original. In fact, none of the... Uh, the breaks were original because St. John Christum was teaching and there was a scribe there writing down everything that he said. Okay, so, um, point number one. 
We must be both childlike and wise. For he that is a babe in wickedness ought also to be wise. Since as wisdom with wickedness would not be wisdom, so also simplicity with folly would not be simplicity. It being requisite both in simplicity to avoid folly and in wisdom wickedness. For as neither bitter nor sweet medicines in excess do good, so neither does simplicity by itself nor wisdom. Right? And I think that's a, that's a, a nice addition to our orthodox understanding of joyful sorrow, right? We're supposed to have innocence, but we're also supposed to be wise. You know, too much innocence, just like too much joy, and we cannot appreciate the wisdom. We cannot appreciate the other. So the two must go hand in hand. I think that's what's being said here, is that we have to have the innocence. In, and I think innocence here... Maybe there is a shift in the understanding of the word innocence. Sometimes we think of innocence almost as if it's a, if it's a pejorative. Like, you know, in their innocence, they're ignorant. But here, innocence is more along the lines of this kind of spiritual openness to God, that innocence there, not, not tainted, so to speak, by the world, right? So we kind of... Some of these words don't necessarily sound the same in, in 2024, but... Okay, point number two. Uh, because remember, St. Paul refers to the law. The law refers to the entire Old Testament. Yet surely it is nowhere written in the law, but as I said before, he calls always the whole of the Old Testament the law both the prophets and the historical books, right? So in the, in the Old Testament, just remember, we have the law, traditionally called the law, which is the first five books. Then we have the historical books, and we have the prophetic books, okay? Uh, similarly, by the way, the New Testament is divided in the same way. We have the Gospels, which is the law. We have the historical, which is the book of Acts. And we have the prophetical, right? So we have that same kind of breakup in the New Testament that the Old Testament is having. But by tradition, when you refer to the law, you're referring to the entirety of the Old Testament. You're not referring only to the, to the Torah, which is the first five books. All right, this is Chrysostom's point out to us. And we should remember that too, because St. Paul often refers to the law, but he's not necessarily talking to the thousands of individual specific laws in the Old Testament. He's talking to the, the Old Testament in its entirety. Okay? And as a reminder, how do we read the Old Testament? Through the eyes of the resurrected Christ. Right? Okay. Section 2, point number 3. Tongues and prophecy both help the church, but not equally. Listen to what he says here. If you will accurately examine, you will understand what is said. For he said not prophecy is not useful to them unbelieving, but it is for a sign as the tongue, i.e. a mere sign without profit. Nor is the tongue any way useful to believers, for its only work is to astonish and to confound. Right? And again, we talked about this the past couple of weeks. It's to draw people in. This, 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 wow, what's going on? And we kind of, it tweaks our interest. Right? That's the purpose of it there. Okay. Section three, point number four. Draw others away from pleasure by showing them it is really the opposite. And this is going to be going on now multiple times before the end of the of the book, before the end of our Bible study the next couple of months. Chrysostom says this, And do thou accordingly likewise. If you would lead men away from pleasure, so show that the thing is bitter. If you would withdraw them from vainglory, show that the thing is full of dishonor. Thus also was Paul used to do. Right, because our temptation is so great. If we're going to draw people away from those temptations, if we're going to draw people away from vainglory, the only way to do that is to help them see that below the surface, it's not what it appears. 
right? And Chris Tom has done this many times with wealth, right? Don't think the wealthy are so happy. You scratch under the surface and they're miserable trying to get more wealth and more and more and more. So if we're going to draw people away from that, you have to show them that what they think is great isn't so great, right? That's, that's the new ones that we have to scratch under the surface. Point number five. St. Paul shows that the gift of tongues was likely to be seen as madness. <laughs> and I make a reference in my footnotes, kind of like the Pentecostal church movement today. Listen to what Chris Thompson says. So also here, because they were wild about this gift of tongues, through their love of glory, he signifies that this, on the other hand, more than anything, brings shame upon them, not only depriving them of glory, but also involving them in a suspicion of madness. So, now remember... We mentioned last week that sometimes St. Paul is talking about this, this charismatic tongues like the modern day Pentecostals, and sometimes he's talking about languages of the world. Nonetheless, either way, the issue is that if it is a matter of confusion to people, it's going to be interpreted as madness. And who's going to follow a madman? right? It's going to actually chase people away. And that's why if you go look back at the book of Acts, when they were speaking in all these different languages, no one's thought they were mad because they understood because they were hearing it in their own language, because that was the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And so there's this really important thing. If what we do, and we can use many examples of our modern orthodox practices if what we do is interpreted as madness it's not going to draw anybody to the church right sometimes that's how i kind of feel about fanaticism if it's going to if it's going to be a turn off to people then it's not going to draw them in okay the same thing here with with the speaking in tongues Point number six, prophecy has no risk of hurting the church. So there's the difference between tongues and prophecy. But prophecy, on the contrary, is both free from reproach among the unbelievers and has very great credit and usefulness. For none will say in regard to prophesying they are mad, nor will anyone deride them that prophecy, but on the contrary will be astonished at and admire them. Right, so there's that drawing in moment when the prophecy is saying, wow, what's going on? Now remember, prophecy is not fortune telling. Prophecy, biblically speaking, is this, I, I, I like to use the language, if things don't change, this is going to happen. That's what's biblical prophecy. It isn't fortune telling, it's that prophetic warning to people. And that's what draws people in. Oh, wait a minute now, if something is gonna happen, if I don't change, maybe, uh, now, okay, give me some more details, some more information, it's gonna draw people in. Clearly, you're not gonna say everything is mad. But what happens in some of these modern examples of prophecy, Right? I saw something on Facebook today because, my gosh, you could not turn the TV on yesterday and not hear about the stinking eclipse, right? Like the first thing. Right. <laughs> and I saw, I saw a, a meme today on Facebook. I, sur I, I survived my fifth end of the world. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that's kind of like the this modern day prophecy is this over and over and over failed fortune telling. The end of the world is coming in 2012 because the Aztec calendar ended in 2012, you know, and these things do end up being madness. But what prophecy really is, is if this doesn't happen, this is gonna happen in the future. And then it's God's way of saying, so when you see this happen, remember I warned you about it. Right, And that's the difference between some of these modern prophets and the biblical prophets in the scriptures. Okay. Point number seven. 
And this is a good one for our sense of humility. Do not use your gifts unless you can benefit others. For if you come not to edify your brother, why do you come here at all? In fact, I do not make much account of the difference of the gifts. One thing concerns me. One thing is my desire, to do all things unto edifying. Right? How many times do we... Even, even prophecy for that matter, right? If we have a desire to sound so wise and to sound so brilliant, if we're saying it just to do it, then there is absolutely no benefit. If what we're saying is not going to be a benefit, let's just shut our mouths, right? And I think that's a really good lesson for our humility because in this contemporary American reality of all information is good information. I got to get my point of view out there. I got to, you know, I've got to add my two cents. And sometimes adding our two cents is more of an act of pride than it is trying to benefit anybody. Just trying to look smart or to look, in this case, look spiritual or look holy or something like that, right? So St. Saint, Saint Paul says, forget about it. And San Christum, if it's not going to help anybody, just leave it alone. It doesn't have anything to do with your pride. Point number eight is in section five in the homily. Well, we're really making lickety split time tonight. Yeah, you want me to slow down? I'll read slower. Point. I can make a few, I can make a few comments if you want. Point number eight. I'll slow down. There's <laughs> more. If you cannot benefit others, <laughs> then keep it to yourself. <laughs> There's good timing there, right? If you cannot benefit others, keep it to yourself. Chris is dumb. If he endures not to be silent, says he, but is so ambitious and vainglorious, let him speak by himself. And thus, by the very fact of so permitting, he greatly checked and put them to shame. In other words, just go home and talk to the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> now here's what I think is <laughs> here's what I think is interesting about, about this this is not the first time we've been told to go be by ourselves if we're not going to worry about other people remember weeks and weeks and weeks ago we were talking about Holy Communion and we were talking about the church, we were talking about the wealthy people getting drunk and this and that. What does St. Paul say? Stay at home if that's what you're going to do. Right? It's interesting that here again, we're like, you know what? Just keep to yourself if you're not here to help other people. I think that's an interesting, there's that, there's that, there's that the continual theme there. All right, but is it that, anything from the chat room since we're running ahead of schedule? All of this talk about insanity and seeming insane. There is that quote, um, the time is coming when men will go mad and they will see someone who is not mad and they will attack him saying, you are mad, you are not like us. Isn't that interesting that we're, we're saying that these people are speaking and they're sounding insane and yet the reality is one day that's not going to be the one that's insane. Yeah, I'm not sure the context is the same here. No, it's, it's just, but, yeah, it's, it's not the same context, oh. but it's the same, it's, it's, but it's, like the sa it's, it's not the same context, but it's the same words kind of thing. Kind of like, is it like, how do we know when? Use your microphone, use your microphone. Almost, if I understand correctly, is it like, how do we know when it's madness? Because so we as Orthodox Christians, we have our perspective. We believe in the Orthodox Church. But the Pentecostal, if they were like if, if they were a fly on the wall, they would think, yeah, well the joke's on them because it's not madness. So how do we know? Is that kind of what it is? Yeah. Eventually eventually we all must look kind of ridiculous to each other. I imagine people people from like in the South, when they come into an Orthodox church, they think we're crazy, they think we're pagans. But we know we're not. And it's that whole sense of, I know a lot of people whose family, they're like, they so heartbroken when they become Orthodox because they're like, oh, we've lost them to the Orthodox. And, and as Orthodox, we're like, yay, we got them in the truth. Yeah. And so it's just that, that concept of. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I, I think, 
I think this context, though, would be more akin to someone, and that's why I compared it to the modern Pentecostals. Because the modern Pentecostals is literally, I'm just uttering gibberish. Right? Which is not the same thing as I'm speaking logical language. It's just that the point I'm making is, is a is madness. There's the difference in this particular context. Literally, the speaking in tongues without an interpreter is they, there's not an intelligible word being said. That's not the same thing as, you know, like when, like when the scripture says, you know, a, f a foolishness to the Greeks, like the cross is death but really life. That's madness, but not the same kind of madness as He's not even using real words. That's the context here, because at least in the context of the, the, the kind of madness where, you know, you're not mad, you're not like us, at least that's drawing people into a conversation, right? This kind of madness is like, you can't even have a conversation with the guy. Like He's not using even real words, you know? Speaking of tongues, Randall wants to know if tongues are used now in the church. And when did we stop? Why, when did we stop? That's a great question, Randall. And I'm going to, at the expense of our chanter, Philip, I'm going to answer as an old joke I heard many years ago. Yes, the modern church speaks in tongues. It's called Byzantine chant because it's so difficult to understand sometimes. I'm, oh, I'm, only, I'm only kidding. No. Um, someone says it's demonic. Someone says it's demonic but. So again, as we mentioned last week, there is an understanding in the church that there was this charismatic unknown language in the ancient church that St. Paul sometimes referred to. Okay. Chrysostom, in this context of the tongues in Corinthians, is talking about languages of the world. Okay, but we cannot deny that the church acknowledges there was this unknown thing that was done. Okay, now again, as we were reminded, I think it was Randall last week, he reminded us that this thing in the Pentecostal church is in fact a learned gibberish. It's not a charismatic spiritual language that the Holy Spirit is inspiring them into. Could you say we have enough people that are linguists that we don't need to speak in tongues anymore because enough people speak multiple languages? I don't know if I'd go that far. Because like, it doesn't serve a purpose now. In the, in the past there was a need to speak in tongues because there was a need to present the faith to people who didn't understand the language. Again, but now there's, the, the need isn't necessarily there. Again, if we're talking about this charismatic language, that's what Randall's question is, I'm guessing. It's not, I mean, yeah, we use multiple languages all the time in that sense of tongues. In the sense of this charismatic language, while we acknowledge there was something there, we don't know much about it, and there's not a whole lot of when was it not used, when did it kind of fall away. Again, if we're following St. Paul's concept here of drawing people in, right, keep in mind that once we've made a name for ourselves, so to speak, that wonder level kind of fades away. For, in, in the same way, you don't see miracles happening today like they happened in biblical times, because the purpose of miracles was to awe people and to draw them in. It's like, wow, what's going on here? This is, this is the power of God. Well, once we get past that point, there's no need for that awe moment necessarily. You were going to say something. Go ahead. I keep hearing charismatic used. What do you mean by that? Uh, sp uh, from the Spirit. Like charisma mean gifts, the gifts of the spirit. That's the charismatic. I had a professor uh, at seminary. He would say something sometimes off script in class, and it, it may have been really brilliant. And we would say, can you say that again? And he would say, I'm sorry. I was having a charismatic moment. He would literally, 
was, was saying, something just came to me, I said it, I'm sorry, I have no idea what really came out or you know, something like that. So that's what we mean by charismatic, this spirit, Holy Spirit inspired moment. There is this evidence of something like that in the ancient church. We don't know much about it. It's clearly not what's going on in the modern Pentecostal movement. Did you have something else to add to that? Yeah, it's, the, the question was, does the church still use tongues, right? Basically, does the church still speak in tongues? But I think that it's a question of what, what is speaking in tongues? So the event at Pentecost was all of a sudden these Jews just started speaking other languages that they never learned, right? Correct. So that's the thing. Is it, I think the question came from someone who, well, the question is implying the, the unknown language, right? I think it's that's implying what, can the you confirm, language. honey, that that's what Randall's talking about? Is talking about the, that 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 charismatic language as opposed to langu like linguistic yeah. languages? What, what, what was news to me at a certain point, I don't know if it was after or before I became Orthodox, was that oh, actually, what happened was not that they were speaking unintelligible words that meant things. It was that maybe you know Thomas all of a sudden started speaking in like Sanskrit, and. Paul all of a sudden started speaking in some other language. You know, they all just started, out of, out of their mouths came pouring languages that they didn't learn, but was completely grammatically correct in all of that, like where people from the next, you know, I don't know, tribe, would be hearing it, and they're saying, how is that guy speaking my language? Well, and he's not, not even that, you know, from my, my people. If you go back and you read how it's conveyed in Acts, it also is open interpretively to that they were speaking and others were understanding, but the implication was I'm speaking one thing and four different cultures are understanding me. Right. That's the way it's expressed in the book of Acts. And that's why Chrysostom, we mentioned this last week, that's why Chrysostom leans toward the understanding of languages as opposed to this spirit language, right? I see that Randall confirmed that it is the, he's talking about the charismatic part but of it, right? But here's the thing, though. If, if it was just that, let's say we're talking about St. Peter. If St. Peter was just speaking in Aramaic or Greek or whatever, and the next guy over could understand him in Sanskrit or the, the, the Chinese or whatever. But then why is speaking in tongues a gift to think, to have? See, it's like, if all I would have to do is just speak in English and he hears me in Mandarin, yeah, then it's again, not a gift. I'm not saying that's what happened in Acts, but it, it can be seen that way yeah. because they start listing all these different languages, but it was only one person speaking. Right, so it's like, right, so. it was a miraculous event. Yes. So And, and it's a proof of, this all just happened. These guys have the Spirit of God. The, fire, the tongues of fire came down. And now this is happening. We, everybody's understanding it. Right. So it's kind of like, once you get that, in, for me at least, this whole kind of, all the questions around about it kind of become less important. Because and it's all to say, to, to reiterate what Chris is saying here, if it's not gonna benefit others, just keep it to yourself. I remember though, like Mike, my no, no, was, <laughs> it's, 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 that was for Sarah. But, <laughs> but to say that, I remember my father had this gift where he could say what people needed to hear. Like, it, like even with my siblings, he, he would know exactly what to say for them to get the point. And he wouldn't say the same thing to the other sibling. He, would, he knew what that one person needed to hear. I always thought of that as a gift. And sometimes I see people as they come into orthodoxy, like God will like show them what they need to see. The same, people don't have the same um, story, conversion story. Right. They're all very unique because for each one, God knows that language that they need to hear right. to, to touch their heart. And part of me feels like that's kind of, in a way, a different type of tongues. But we don't need tongues like we did in the past. Correct. Right. That's so, the so, moment. That's so the, the church only, what's going on here. The church kind of really is not, they, they say like we don't change, but we also don't hold on to death 
old baggage. If we don't need it anymore, we let it go. We well, and just to, uh, and because you said it, as a reminder to everyone watching, the statement the church never changes means the truth doesn't change. How we live the truth is constantly changing because the world changes around us. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. Right. People say like, no, we never change. And they make us more into a museum than an active living faith. And um, Michael II says- By the way, Michael says, came to your defense. Michael says, of course, there are folks. Michael came to your defense. We have a guy, he's Mike the Second, by the Mike way. Mike II, okay. So Thanks. moving on to section six, that kind of delayed us a little bit. So we're making, see that we, we slowed down a little bit, okay. And I think this is a good shift because this talks about edification and benefit too. Prophets are subject to the church's assessment, right? So this is the whole thing and let them, uh, well, this translation says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. I think, Sarah, from your translation there says, let them ponder, I think, right? So this is where Chris is not saying, Prophets are subject to the church's assessment. For of this also at the beginning he bade them beware, when he introduced the distinction between divination and prophecy. And now he bids them discriminate and spy out the matter, so that no satanic teacher might privately enter. Right? Now, that is a very profound warning. Right? And I would say this is kind of our defense against this gibberish movement. And that is that the church has to ponder what you said and say, no, wait a minute. What makes you think that that's God inspired as opposed to Satan inspired? Right? Because the church, the body of Christ, has a consciousness to it. Right? And this, in fact, ha is the long-standing tradition of the church. Just because one person said it doesn't make it automatically become universal truth. Right? I, I like to say this many times. St. Paul had to correct his teaching. We've seen here where St. Paul said, you're not understanding it correctly, where others are being corrected. So even in these prophetic moments, what is being prophesied or prophesied? I can never remember which, trans which pronunciation is correct. Someone not profited. Has to be evaluated by the church. I think that's a really cool warning, right? Not only is St. Paul saying, let them ponder, but Chris is saying one step further, let them make sure it's not from Satan. And again, that's very anti-American because in our current world, if I say it, it has equal value. And who's to say we're not being uh, Satan inspired as opposed to divinely inspired? One of the reasons why we as Orthodox, what are we loyal to? The teachings of the apostles. We do not, that's what, you know, we don't do these new things. All of a sudden, something new, some new prophecy, some new something happens that is totally contrary to what the apostles taught. We would never follow that train of thought. You had to go say something? Oh, go ahead. And that's why the um, bishops are so important. Yes. That, the bishops are the protectors is. of the truth, absolutely. I know, but it broke my tooth, so I took Okay. Point number 10. And this is what's going to lead us into our life, exp exp uh, life application. It is not good to jump between topics in church, right? Now, when you're reading this, understand something difficult for modern Christians to read because it's not quite explained in the scriptures. When St. Paul is talking about worship, there wasn't this free-for-all going on. It was structured, and it was led by the bishops, which were the apostles and whatever, whatever bishop they ordained in that particular room, because bishop means overseer. There was not this free-for-all going on saying, okay, everybody, let's just get together and talk. There was a structured experience going on. So it doesn't quite say it like that, but we know it to be true. Right? There was not this randomness going on. Now, it wasn't universally 
um, like it is today where we're all doing the same thing. It wasn't consistent across the globe well, yet. In in North, I'm talking about then. Yeah, yeah. But it was structured. It wasn't a free for all. And, and sometimes we read this with, oh, three people are just going to get up and speak, but Father never gets and lets anybody get up and speak. You know, there, there, there was a structure to what was going on. Right. Yeah. Based on like pattern, yeah. But my, my point is that it doesn't quite say it like that here. It. We were talking about this today, Philip and I. That there's this modern movement in Protestantism to reestablish like the house church, as if the apostles and the early Christians didn't want to be in the temple. Right, And so as if they wanted this whole, just my family and my house, that was not the desire at all, right? So there was a structure going on. And this is why St. Paul's warning them, because it was leaning toward free for all. No, 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 no. Let it be done. Let it be careful. Let it be structured and let people evaluate. Go ahead. Well, let me, let me read the point first. For if him that speaks with tongues, he altogether forbid to speak, when he was not an interpreter, when he has not an interpreter because of the unprofitableness, reasonably also he bids restrain prophecy, if it have not this quality, but creates confusion and disturbance and unseasonable tumult. Right? So that was this. He doesn't want just jumping from topic to topic to topic. That's that. We don't want that free for all going on. We want it to be structured. Go ahead, Philip. Yeah, just as uh, a side comment to this idea that we're, we would be recreating the early church modus operandi if we just start doing house church because there's a lack of understanding about what it was. So not only was it, like, like you're saying, a structured experience and it was liturgical and, and everything, but uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is today people think organized religion equals bad. Right. If, it, if it's organized and you have to go somewhere consistently on a regular basis, then that is faux religion, which is itself faux religion. Like, it's, yeah. it's a wrong idea. Right. But that's what a lot of people think. I'm, I'm spiritual, not religious. It's like the number one catchphrase that I hear all the time. They're also their own God. Yeah, well, basically. So now, speaking of the church never changes, now we're leading into our, into our life application. And I have titled this, It is Time to Restore Sacredness to the Church. Now, let me just preface this with, remember, Chrysostom was the late 4th century, 385. And he's already referencing the need to restore a healthier atmosphere in the church. <laughs> so this too is a lifelong struggle. St. Paul was talking about it, restoring a proper structure. You know, some 300 years later, St. John Christian was like, no, come on, we got to get, get things back into some kind of proper structure. And how ironic that there's this move to destructure in modern Christianity. And so our life application tonight is, it is time to restore sacredness to the church. So if you're watching online, I'm going to put some slides up so you don't have to just wonder what we're reading. Okay, next first point. The church has changed. For in, the, for in truth, the church was a heaven then. This, now remember, this is Christ I'm speaking at the end of the fourth century. For in truth, the church was a hev haven, a heaven then, the spirit governing all things and moving each one of the rulers and making him inspired. But now we retain only the symbols of those gifts. For now we also speak two or three and in turn, and when one is silent, another begins. But these are only signs and memorials of those things. Right? Now, there is an implication there that already by the fourth century, we were in this ritual habit, doing things because the apostles did them. For example, one of the things that uh, we don't fully appreciate today 
was it was also a custom, at least at the time of Christmas time, this is why it says two or three are speaking, there would have been more than one homily in church. I know, right? What? Yes. The clergy would have... Long enough. <laughs> <laughs> they probably would have been in there all day. Church was longer back then. Church was long. As long as it is now, church was longer back then. For the amount of time the guys hang out drinking coffee and talking after church, that's just, you really don't have a post to like to stand up. But there was, there was this tradition, for example, Chrysostom would have been the final preacher, not the only preacher. <laughs> Right, and so he's he's making reference that you know where he says, but now retain only that we have two or three speakers, and in turn, these are the preachers. So now we you know we have a, a, only one preacher happening in church, right? So the church does change, as Pastor was pointing out, but again his point is that we've lost this sacredness. So even we have to get back. It's not just it's. It's not just about rote repetition. You know, I, there's, there's good and bad to our ritual, and we can always revitalize and restore the sacredness to the ritual, I think is what Chris Estam's point is here. Not just a memory of what was in the past. We could always just do that, couldn't we? We could, like someone... Have multiple preachers? Yeah, they could just decide to do that. No, I'm serious. Yeah, but I mean, I well... Say, well, I want to do this now. Yes and no, because um, following this structural thing right now, so we're sitting here 2024. Chris Estam is preaching because he's not the pri a priest in Antioch. He's not even a bishop yet um, in this particular series. And so we're talking about the fourth century is the height of this consolidation of the, of the liturgics, liturgical experience, right? So this, you know, for 300 years, different regions, different, different cities, different bishops had these different structures. Now in the imperial church, there's this standardization happening universally within the empire. Right? So Chrysostom is, is in the middle of all that at the end of the fourth century. So for us to just change, it's not my prerogative, right? Because this is something that has been handed to us. And St. Paul, even St. Paul says, right? Maintain what you have received. So if we've received something, but I think what's important there is that it's not a dead repetition, meaning we know for sure we're not doing things today like Chrysostom did them. Chrysostom wasn't doing things the way Paul was doing them. That means it's okay to have liturgical reform. It's okay if the church in an organized manner says, what's the liturgy going to look like for the rest of the 21st century? Right? And so there's pieces, like I said, uh, Seraphim, as long as it is now, it is shorter than it used to be. Right? So things can change and maybe sometimes should. Even the petitions, we've added petitions to give extra time for the tray to be passed. If we weren't passing a tray at that time during the liturgy. I think those were already there and then they were omitted, but now they're done. Well, they're, actually they weren't there. They were added accidentally because of the influence of pre-sanctified liturgy because they exist in pre-sanctified liturgy. And so they were, but nonetheless, we add them here, other churches don't. So there's time for the tree to be passed. That's her point there. Yeah, okay. So moving on to our next point. The ancient church had a stronger faith. There's no doubt about it in my opinion. Chrysostom says this, they all met together in old time and sang psalms in common. This we also do now, but then among all was there one soul and one heart. But now, not in one single soul can we see that unanimity. Rather, great is the warfare everywhere. Peace even now to all, he that presides in the church prays for, 
entering as it were into his father's house, but of this peace the name is frequent, but the reality nowhere. Now again, that's the end of the fourth century. So the church had already been struggling to maintain this sacredness. Okay, and I think you could say that through history, there have been more sacred moments and less sacred moments. It's part of where monasticism has an influence in the church in later centuries. Remember, in the fourth century, monasticism was just getting started because with the imperial church comes a lot of lazy Christians. And so the monastic movement was a response to the lazy Christians. I'm going to go live a more intense expression of my Christianity because these people in the city aren't even taking it seriously. And Chrysostom, by his comments here, is verifying that that's a reality in the fourth century. Go ahead. Was the early church living monastically before it became no. legalized? No, the, the monasticism... Like and stuff? No, no, no. What, what monasticism is, is basically uh, a response to die to the world so you are alive in Christ. In other words, prior to freedom, it was risky enough just being a Christian. Once Christianity became the imperial religion, you were no longer at any risk. You weren't at all willing to die to go to church. And so monasticism was a response to that. I'm not even giving anything up now being part of this legal church, this state church. I don't have to, there's no, there's no struggle at all. There's no cross at all. That's where monasticism developed, right? And the influence over the church now is monasticism since that time has been our, the church's conscience. Every time the church kind of departs from the sacredness and departs from the seriousness, monasticism is there to remind us, no, we really need to be focusing on God here. So now there's this balancing act going on that monasticism helps ground us sometimes and helps remind the church before we go too far down the secular path in the imperial church, we're being called back to this sense of sacred. And the, 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 probably the, the greatest example of that is in that the liturgy that we now have is a melding of the monastic liturgy and the city church liturgy the imperial liturgy, right? So that came, out of the, that came out of the iconoclastic controversy at the turn of the millennium, right? Because monasticism helped save the church with iconoclasm, then the monastic liturgy becomes more prevalent in the city as opposed to the imperial liturgy. And today's divine liturgy is a melding of that. Right, so the, there's this beautiful coexistence between the city church and the monastic church now. But originally, the church was the church because it, you were risking enough just going to church. Go ahead. I've never been to a monastery. Is the divine liturgy there still different, or are they doing ours? No, the divine liturgy is the same with very minor differences. For example, a monastery always does the catechumen prayers. Okay, um, the monastery will add extra readings and hymns that are no longer, for example, if they will read the reading of the day and the reading of the feast, if the feast reading is not the same as the, day, of the reading of the day, they won't just skip one reading. In the city church, we'll just choose one. But in the monastery, for example, on a Saturday, they'll read two, sometimes two readings to meet the reading of the day and the reading of the particular saint or whatever that's going on. So there's some differences, but you'd recognize 99% of it at, at a monastery. Well, women will sit on one side and men will sit on the other. Okay. Wait, I do have a question. Just, just yes. When, when he, he says, says peace, the, the, name, the, the name is frequent, frequent but the reality is nowhere. nowhere. Is he referring to we're always praying for peace, but there are, nobody is peaceful? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then Michael wants to know 
um, and why it is, do we think Orthodox is growing so fast now, despite the statistics showing that less people are identifying as Christians around the world? Why, why do we think, why is it that Orthodoxy seems to be getting so many converts? Besides the phenomenon that's debatable too. That's debatable. Well, I'm, I'm not quick because I see his point. Do you think this may be part of? I don't know what the this may be part of is what he's referring to. So ask him to clarify that there. So the church is being more casual. Are the churches being more casual? So you were saying once the faith became legal, nobody, had, nobody was really carrying any crosses. Right. And so therefore, we became lazy and then the monastery started. And now that everybody's is so lazy, people are getting so lazy and so watered down, people just really want more. And they're coming to orthodoxy because they're looking for more than just the watered down version. I think that's part of it. I, I think there's also in 30 years of ministry, there's one constant, not universal, but constant theme that I see often, and that is that in Protestantism, generally speaking, the ground is always shifting under people's feet, right? There's not anything to hold on to to ground you in Protestantism. There's the, the theology is constantly changing, and this is there's there's no there's no grounding there. In Orthodoxy, there's a grounding element, which is, draws a lot of people into Orthodoxy because, and I hear I hear this a lot. I'm just tired of my church always changing. Now. That is also why the orthobro movement is so strong. Oh, is that a real word? That's what's the internet movement, yeah. So, because here's what's happening. I'm, I'm not me, me personally, obviously. I'm leaving Protestantism because I'm sick of everything always changing. I'm coming here because you don't change. Now suddenly you're changing? And that's why I always remind people, it's not that the church never changes, the truth never changes. Everything has evolved. I mean, we're constantly changing the way we respond to the truth, the real of the truth, how the truth makes us respond to the reality of today. And that's part of, so if, I'm le if, if the reason I'm leaving Protestantism is because the ground is always shifting underneath me, because this is what you see, then why don't you just become Protestant if you're going to change the church? But there's no historical basis to say the way we do things, we've always done them. Because the liturgy is not at all like St. Paul's liturgy was. Not at all like St. Paul's liturgy was. There's kernels of it. The, the style might be the same, but the prayers are not the same. Hymns are not the same. I mean, one of my favorite examples, if we're the church that never changes, then why do we sing only begotten Son of God in the middle of liturgy when that was written in the 600s? Order. You know, but that but that's my point of you can't say the church never changes. What never changes is the truth of God. The dogmas. Huh? And what the church is. Correct. But what's constantly changing is how we're living out that truth because the world is facing us with different things. Okay, and so, but that, but that's why we're getting conflicts with a mood. Like I call it, the, the ortho, the ortho bros are coming in, and saying, "No, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. The church never changed." Well, no, you, I'm sorry, you were misled in your catechumen process. The church changes quite a bit over the centuries. But even the liturgy, if you have one priest, it's one way. If you have two or more priests, we add different things. If there's a bishop that changes, we add certain verses. If there's a patriarch, we add certain verses. Verses. If there's more than one bishop, it changes. Yeah, but I mean, even those changes are standard. But but the fact that some people would say, yeah. wait, this is a what's happened to the liturgy? Why why are we adding things to it, taking things out of it? No, I think what people are afraid of is anything that's going to water it down. All right. So now we're now we're way behind schedule. Now it's eight o'clock. We got to get caught up. All right. So. All right, so here we go. Next point. The church has lost its sense of sacred. Remember, this is, it's ironic. We're hearing this from the fourth century and we're saying it still today. 
For the church is no barber's or perfumer's shop, nor any other merchant's warehouse in the marketplace, but a place of angels, a place of archangels, a place of God, heaven itself. Now that's the part that never changes. The church is that sacred place. We are the ones who stop making it sacred. And sometimes even in our contemporary church, we have to get back to some of those points. Next point. The church is not a place for secular matters. Or if any wish to say or hear any scandal, you will find that this too is to be had here more than in the forum without. So, right? This is giving us a, a glimpse into the fourth century. And if you wish to hear anything of political matters or the affairs of private families or the camp, go not to the judgment hall, nor sit in the apothecary shop. For here, here I say, are those who report all these things more accurately, and our assemblies are anything rather than a church. I mean, the, the image of the gossip mill in the fourth century Chrysostom's church in Antioch, it must have been a wild experience. And this is why, again, what's benefiting us, for, for me, for me, not only as a priest, but as a 21st century Christian, when I read St. Paul talking about the bad behavior in the church, I'm comforted that it's not a new problem. When I hear Chrysostom talk about the 4th century bad behavior in the church, I am comforted that it's not a new problem. It helps me be grounded because it reminds us we are really all still struggling to be what we're supposed to be. This myth that the ancients were somehow so much more superior to us, as if they were not sinful. If they were like that, St. Paul would not have had to write what he wrote. If the fourth century was this fantasy land of church, Chrysostom would not have had to write what he wrote. That comforts me not to give me an excuse to my poor behavior, but to say, we're still struggling and it doesn't mean we are any, we're somehow horrible Christians today and they were somehow great Christians then. We're all involved in the struggle. So for me, it helps us have some grace that this church has been struggling with this real human problem from the very first days. But it does give you a glimpse. I mean, he's like, don't, don't bother going to the barber shop. You want to hear about politics? Come to church. Right? The, the, some things never change, right? Okay. <laughs> point, number t point number 15. Unity in heart and voice is a must in the church. For in truth, there ought to be one voice in the church always, even as there is but one body. Remember in the, in the prayer, right, when I come out, let us love one another that with oneness of mind we may confess, right? There's that unity of our belief and our unity of our hearts. Therefore, both he that reads utters his voice alone, and the bishop himself is content to sit in silence, and he who chants chants alone, and though all utter the response, the voice is wafted as from one mouth. And he that pronounces a homily pronounces it alone. But when there are many conversing on many and diverse subjects, why do we disturb you for no good? Since surely, unless you thought that we are but disturbing you for no good, you would not in the midst of our speech on such high matters discourse on things of no consequence. Now, what that means is, People were talking in church, right? Even during the homily, even during the prayers, it's that this is what he's saying, that in the fourth century, people were talking in church. They were not paying attention. Oh, the screen you said is off. Okay. 
Oh, isn't that what I said? That's what I just read. Yeah, that's what I just read. Okay, maybe the commenting is off. <sighs> yeah. Can they not hear me? No, they can hear me. Okay. You continue doing the same thing? Well, and again, that's what, uh, what, what comforts me is that this is not a new problem. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be combating it. It just means it's not a new problem. Okay, that's all. That's why it comforts me in that sense. But as we know more, we should be better. Yes, we should be better. We should be better. Okay. If the secular is brought into the church, we have no hope of winning the battle against the passions. Uh, there we go. And ye gape after superfluities, and leaving the truth, pursue all sorts of shadows and dreams. Are not all present things a shadow and dreams, and worse than a shadow? For both before they appear, they fly away, and before they are flown, the trouble they give is much, and much more the pleasure. Let one acquire in this world and bury in the earth ever such abundance of wealth. Yet when the night is past, naked he shall depart hence, and no wonder. So, again, this whole thing, this whole life application, it's time to restore sacredness to the church. What St. John Christum was fighting in the 4th century, we are absolutely fighting today. We don't come to church for the sacredness. We come to church for the fellowship. We come to church for the this, for the that. I'm not saying as an excuse. I'm just saying we still have work to do. We have to fight to restore the sacredness in the church, the oneness, the unity, the holiness. And if we're going to bring all that other garbage inside, then we'll never defeat the passions. If coming into the church is not a haven from the world, right? This is one of the reasons why originally there were no windows at the floor level of the church. The windows were only way up high above. At least our windows are stained glass, you can't see through them. Because when you come into the church, you're leaving the world behind. Right? You're coming into heaven, but as we talked about in Orthodoxy 101, you're coming into something to leave the other stuff behind. Chrysostom's point here is if we're going to bring all that garbage in with us, then we'll never, we'll never win the battle. Okay. It doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge those battles are real. It just means that, you know what, this is why, what are we, what's the hymn of the, of the great entrance? Let us leave the worldly cares behind. Right? Let us lay aside all the cares of the world so that we can receive the king of all. Right? That's the essence here, that we're leaving that stuff behind. So if we bring it in, then, we have, then, we, then it's a lost cause, a total lost cause. And that's why the narthex is important, too. Correct. The narthex is where we shed all that garbage. Okay. Our send-off. Well, the world can be garbage sometimes. All right. Here we go. Here's our send-off. We are way over time, but that's okay. Exchange the secular for the sacred. In order, therefore, that we may be delivered from, both from the dreams and from the evils that are not in dreams, instead of covetousness, let us choose almsgiving. Instead of repaying mercy to mankind, for thus we shall obtain the good things both present and to come through the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So, ultimately, if we want to restore the sacredness, let's exchange the sacred, the secular. Even one of the, the prayers of the liturgy says, exchange tempor for, for eternal, and we're giving away the worldly things. And ultimately, what does the word holy mean? Not earthly. And so, how wonderful it even talks about, right? Choose almsgiving instead of covetousness. This is where we're Especially now during our great Lenten season, it's our practice time. We're practicing getting rid of all the secular stuff. We're practicing leaving the worldly stuff behind so that we can embrace the sacred. All right. A lot of conversation tonight. I think it was great. Doesn't bother me at all. Let's just kind of keep track of the clock because we are a little over time. I hope you don't mind. 
But it was good. Next week, session 38, homily 37. So if you have to pick it up and read it, you can, it's right here. The study guide will be available in a couple of days and you can go ahead and read it and have, and be ready. Until next week, God bless you. And don't forget to live a new life in Christ. Be Transfigured is a production of Be Transfigured Ministries in cooperation with the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Tarpon Springs, Florida. We depend upon your generosity to maintain our ministry. You can make a safe online donation when you visit our website, liveanewlifeinchrist.org.